episode and we are recording. Okay. Oh, I just lost my presentation mode. Okay. Uh, well, hopefully everyone can hear me. I just want to acknowledge the people on the bottom of the slide that uh, helped uh, organize this webinar, even though some of them are not uh, speaking. And in terms of uh, speakers, I've just listed them here and so and the topics that we'll be covering I'll try to give a brief introduction and then we'll move on to some more specific uh, opportunities and targets in Latin America and then of course at the end uh, open it up for discussion and we hope to have a lot of comments and questions and additional ideas come out of this so I'll just first start with why Latin America and of course this list is in is very long, but uh, you can't hardly, uh, you have to start with the fact that there are the largest magnitude earthquakes, some of the slowest recorded earthquakes, tsunamis, slow slip events, tremors, high rates of seismicity, and all of this gives us a chance to observe sort of the full earthquake cycle at multiple scales, the pre, co, and post seismic response to uh, subduction zone earthquakes. There are also frequent earthquakes, and not only in the subduction zone, uh, but also in the overriding plate. And some of these uh, earthquakes in the upper plate are near population centers and incredibly damaging. And they've uh, wiped out whole uh, towns and communities. Uh, there's also 320 active volcanoes from Mexico down to Chile. We're talking about over 8,000 kilometers of subduction zone. And so that provides uh, a lot of opportunities to uh, study arc processes, hazards, magmatic processes, um, both active ones and through time, because there's places where there's ancient arcs exposed down into the lower crust. And of course, there's this long, continuous subduction with lots of a long strike and up and down dip variations. And there's also mountain building and high topography and many uh, lithospheric processes that go along with subduction zones. Um, so I'll just jump in with just a couple of uh, figures and examples to remind you of some of these things. And of course, here are some maps uh, from Slab 1.0 of the Central and South America. The Cocos Plate is, is subducting beneath North America and the Caribbean Plate in Central America and uh, has a lot of seismicity, has subducting ridges. Um, and of course a lot of volcanoes. In, in South America the Nazca Ridge is primarily subducting beneath South America. Again there are ridges going down, there's changes in slab dip and changes uh, as slab tears and changes in, in slab geometry. Uh, for the most part in South America the slab extends down into the lower mantle so it gives us opportunities to look at that. And there's places where you can see in the uh, map of the earthquakes in South America that in parts of Chile and Argentina to the south, the earthquakes don't extend down below about 250 or 300 kilometers, uh, but other imaging methods show us that there is indeed a slab there and it goes all the way down into the transition zone. So there are questions about why there are big chunks of the slab that have no seismicity and others that are very uh, seismic. And of course there are many studies now coming out on the details of ruptures of the different uh, earthquakes, and this is just one of many examples from Central America uh, event in 2002 in Costa Rica that uh, ruptured uh, beneath the Nicoya Peninsula, and and this is important because there's actually a landmass over the main part of the slip you can see in this uh, particular uh, joint inversion, and now it's possible with with land right above that you can have uh, a lot more recordings right above the rupture. This is also a place where there's a lot of past earthquakes. You can see those in the blue circles. And to the southeast, there's a lot of slow slip events uh, along this margin of Costa Rica. There's also tsunamogenic uh, events such as this 1992 event that's up dip right along the trench that uh, generated a very large tsunami relative to its size. So again, there's a full range of processes going on that can be studied all along uh, Central America. And there are other regions that have land closer to the trench or over parts of the seismogenic zone, including um, other parts of Costa Rica, Mexico, southern Ecuador, and northern Peru. So these all provide advantages when trying to uh, study this process, especially when you have less uh, offshore measurements. 
And going to South America, again, there are many, many earthquakes, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but I just want to set the stage for some later presentations that just since 2010, there have been four significant earthquakes, three of them greater than magnitude 8 and one a 7.8. And all of these have ruptured in places where it's been a while since the last earthquake and where we know something about uh, the previous earthquake. Uh, and so <clears throat> on average, the South America subduction zone produces a a large magnitude earthquake uh, roughly every decade and of course we're seeing a lot more than that just in the last uh, six years. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, to look at some of the long strike variations and segmentation both up and down dip and try to get a better idea of what controls some of these ruptures as well as the, the tsunamis that they generate. Of course, there's also a lot of work on the inner seismic coupling along the plate interfaces, both in Central and South America, and this is just one example. Um, and you may have noticed from this slide and the previous one that uh, in southern Ecuador and northern Peru, there are no big magnitude 8 earth earthquakes shown, and that's true for about 500 years. So the question it has always been, is this a place that has a very long recurrence interval or it's just not very well coupled? And a recent paper from 2014 shows that perhaps it's not all that well coupled and that there is some uh, slip partitioning and slivers in the overriding plate. You can see based on the continuous and campaign GPS data shown in this, the central panel B. And of course, a lot of this is campaign data and it would be important to get a lot more uh, GPS uh, measurements and continuous GPS stations in, in this region. And finally on the right is the, is the interstation coupling from the, the GPS. And why is there such large variations in the coupling? What is so different about uh, this central part of this uh, subduction zone where there aren't big earthquakes? Uh, if we go on to volcanic activity, uh, out of the 320 volcanoes, uh, uh, some of them have been studied and, and we'll hear a little more about that in the next presentation. But if you just look at uh, some of these volcanoes have a lot of uplift um, going on in inflation and on the left is a um, plot of the uplift for the Laguna del Mar Chile uh, system and you can see that there's been about 250 millimeters a year of uplift since 2007. So this is really screaming up and you can see it relative to some of the other uh, active volcanoes around the world or systems including Yellowstone. And there's a lot of opportunity to improve our sort of schematic models uh, such as this one shown in the center uh, where we combine all the geophysical and geochemistry and, and petrology data to try to understand these magmatic systems both at the shallow depths and also in the mid-crust. And finally, uh, there's an example of a shear wave velocity model from a joint inversion of ambient noise and receiver functions that shows a very large mid-crustal uh, low velocity zone or a partial melt zone under the Altiplano Puna volcanic complex in southern Bolivia. And it, there's a lot of opportunity to combine things like this kind of imaging with attenuation, VPVS ratios, and uh, petrology and remote sensing to try to uh, understand what uh, these low velocity zones are, how much partial melt and what they're uh, composed of and how they behave and how they feed to the shallower systems that actually might erupt. And finally, for those of you interested in deeper processes, there's a lot of work being done to uh, image the subduction slabs at depth and we're starting to get pretty good images of them. Um, Here's just a couple of examples where the slab looks like it penetrates into the lower mantle at different dips along different portions of the South American subduction zone. And there's also a lot of other anomalies that we're seeing uh, below the slab, for example, but there's still a lot of work to be done to figure out if those are remnant slabs or water in the transition zone or, uh, in fact, artifacts from uh, the techniques. And much of this was done with temporary data uh, that's been collected over the last 25 years, but clearly there's a lot of opportunities uh, to improve these images. And um, 
I have one other example here of, of shear wave splitting that's plotted at 280 kilometers on top of a shear wave velocity model showing the slab in northern Peru. And the neat thing about this paper by Eakin et al. Um, 2016 is that the anisotropy in the slab, and these are waves going right up through the slab, uh, recorded at stations above the slab, uh, show that the anisotropy is not um, the fossil anisotropy uh, that the slab probably had when it formed at the ridge, but rather it's been modified uh, as it as it's being subducted. And all of the new observations that we tend to focus on um, really need to go into modeling and there's a lot of modeling going on in South America that could be improved with um, more interaction and more uh, data. And this is just one example of a 4D geodynamic model of thermal anomalies of the slab in South America using plate kinematic seafloor ages, tectonic features, uh, subducting slabs and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and there's, so there's a huge opportunity to integrate a lot of data into a whole variety of uh, models and scales. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure to work on and leverage on and of course all of this needs to be worked out with, with lots of um, MOUs and things but um, here are some of the some of the existing seismic stations in Central and South America by type and of course these are not complete. Um, in addition to these there are there's data from about a thousand uh, seismic stations from temporary deployments that have happened in both Central and South America and much of that data is already archived and open and we can make similar maps for all kinds of other data but again you'll notice that there's almost no offshore permanent um, observations that are going to be critical for any kind of real-time uh, monitoring and finally just to touch upon um, GPS stations in parts of Latin America. Again, there is quite a bit to build on. Uh, here's one example from plate velocities uh, in Central America and to the right are existing GPS stations as part of the Chile National Network. There's an additional 20 stations planned to be installed this year in Chile and again uh, no offshore observations and the real key is to find a way to get offshore measurements uh, at a low cost. But I think in Latin America there's a lot of opportunities to partner with people to help make that possible. And finally, um, in terms of partners, um, it's a great place for international partners. There's a lot of international collaboration already going on across all kinds of geoscience disciplines. There's a lot of emerging and expanding uh, geodetic and seismic networks as well as INSAR and MT going on. And of course, there's collaborators from all of Latin American countries, the US, Japan, Germany, UK, France, Spain, and many, many more. Um, and all of these groups have active research programs uh, related to subductions on science. And there's lots of examples of ongoing collaborations that I won't go through. There's also a, a good history of multinational responses to the biggest earthquakes. And the last four have had international responses of various sorts. Uh, so I think it, in summary, there's a lot of opportunities um, to build infrastructure, share infrastructure, and do and partner with many, many different international uh, groups to uh, do great subductions on science. And I think I'll stop there and we can move on to Michael. All right. Thanks, Susan. Um, Michael, I will give you screen sharing privileges right now. So uh, you'll see a pop-up on your desktop and just select that. Which, where it says show my screen? That's right. Okay. Is that working? Yep. I see your slide. All right. All right. So uh, thank you, Susan, for covering a lot of the seismological inf information on um, Central America, because I'm going to focus on uh, geochemistry, and specifically on uh, three problems which I think are will be well solved by a subduction zone observatory. And one of them has to do with mantle flow in southern Central America. 
And this was proposed quite a while ago, but we lack data on this on a critical region where we might be able to image the mantle flow. A second uh, idea is that there's a recent paper that showed a, a magma reservoir beneath the uh, Mobotombo volcano in Nicaragua. It would be wonderful to have a grid of such magnetotelluric observatories so we could really understand better where the magma bodies are. And the last thing I wanted to describe is that as you go from Nicaragua down to southern Costa Rica to the Talamanca Mountains, you go from uh, arc geochemistry to continental crust geochemistry and the uh, crustal thickness changes from being arc-like in Nicaragua to being uh, more or less normal continental uh, velocity profile beneath central Costa Rica. And so different segments of the margin have had rather different histories and they have provided different results. And we can see on the surface what we, uh, the, you know, the geochemical things, but we, we need much better geophysical control over the uh, crustal and upper mantle structure. Uh, I'm a geochemist, and just uh, as an aside, what I like to do is to create things like that MM line at the top which is the mantle that you need to melt to make Cerro Negro volcanoes lavas. And you make it from a whole bunch of different things, including depleted mantle, a fluid from subducting serpentine, a fluid from subducting oceanic crust, and a fluid from subducting sediments. And you can mix these up and get the right chemistry, but this is a black box. And as a geochemist, what I'd really love is not a black box, but uh, magma bodies, uh, fluid flow paths, and so forth, some actual physical constraints. And I sort of summarized uh, a geochemical wish list, which I'm not going to go over for lack of time, but basically uh, from a geochemical perspective uh, and a volcanological perspective, I'd really like to know where the magma bodies are. And uh, it looks like with modern tools, it's now possible to do that fairly well. So let me go to the first idea, which I think uh, can be addressed, and that is this uh, older idea that mantle is going to flow through the gap between the Nazca and Cocos plates, which are subducting beneath South America and Central America. And many people have followed up on this idea and proposed different models, but there is some field data which I think is fairly compelling and makes it an interesting uh, thing to test, and that field data comes from uh, Gazelle, and he proposed that mantle was flowing from underneath the Cocos Ridge across Costa Rica and then bends northwest and proceeds up into Nicaragua. And the evidence for this was the ages of small alkaline volcanoes behind the volcanic front, and when, uh, when this starts at about six million years ago, it's in central, it's in southern Costa Rica, and then it migrates all the way up into Nicaragua in a rather nice uh, linear regression. The other arrow, the green arrow, tracks the movement of adachitic magmatism to the southeast. And we believe this magmatism forms when you take the altered oceanic crust and put an edge of that up against hot asthenosphere, causing it to melt. So if you melt the altered oceanic crust, you get something like an adachite. So we believe that the green line is tracking the edge of the Cocos Plate as it is uh, slowly migrating to the southeast. Currently, it's at the Panama Fracture Zone, the uh, PFZ, that's the boundary. So this uh, looks like a good place to test mantle flow. And we have some information, but we don't have it really in the place where it's needed. So the information from APT is really excellent, but we really need information in that red box. And there is some preliminary work by uh, Levin and Linkmer in southern Costa Rica, which shows that uh, some of these uh, SKS uh, uh, splitting vectors are perpendicular to the coast, which would be uh, consistent with uh, the gazelle model. But it's complicated, and we really need a lot more observations. 
My second uh, proposal is that it's really wonderful sometimes to get uh, a different technique. And in this case, it's magnetotelurix is a line across central Nicaragua by Brasa et al. And they found what looks like a magma reservoir underneath Momotombo volcano, which erupted this year. And so it's probably oversized and so forth, and it's probably a mush, not a melt, but this sort of information would be wonderful, and this is one, this is 2D, I guess, but we really need to have a grid, not a line. So this is a plea for more information like this. And this, uh, this last idea is that there's very different types of crust as you go from Nicaragua to Costa Rica. And in this slide, the stipple is the chemistry of continental crust. The red dots are the recent volcanics of central Costa Rica, and they're very close to continental crust. If you go back in time to greater than 12 million years, central Costa Rica does not have continental affinity. It looks like an arc. So those blue dots, those lower ones, are more arc-like. Now, if you migrate in space, if you go from central Costa Rica to Nicaragua, in Nicaragua, you get a pattern very much like those blue dots. It's an arc pattern. So in central Costa Rica, it used to be like an arc, but now it's like a continent. So something has happened, and it would be wonderful to be able to see geophysically uh, what has gone on. And we can see some of that. So in this uh, diagram is the seismic refraction line by the Wyoming group, which went across uh, the Cordillera, uh, the, the Valle Central and the Cordillera Central of, of Costa Rica. And the line that they got is that blue line in the diagram on the right. And it is a slower velocity than typical uh, crustal profiles for island arcs, and it's almost as slow as continental crust. So it's a pretty close, or maybe just touching the top of continental crust. So this is a, a place where a little bit of continental crust has probably been made in the last couple of million years. And if we look more broadly at the margin, uh, there's a region down there called T-Continental. That's the Talamanca mountain range in southernmost Costa Rica. And it's much higher than central Costa Rica. And the chemistry of the youngest volcanics is very much like continental chemistry. So it's a very good continental al analog geochemically. And we don't have sufficient geophysical data to know what the crust looks like. And if we look at other areas, Nicaragua is not continental at all geochemically, and it's, uh, the crust is 30 kilometers thick or so. If we go a little bit further south into northern Costa Rica, you're sort of in between continent and uh, arc. And then in central Costa Rica, it's almost continental, get down to Talamanca, and it does, in fact, appear to be continental. So uh, having... Uh, SVOs in various places will allow us to look at the different experiments that nature has run so that we can compare the different results that we have to the geological history we can infer from the surface and I think understand much more about the process. So looking broadly at wider areas is something I'm much in favor of. And I think that's about 10 minutes, so I'm done. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, so our next speaker is Alan Husker, and uh, Alan will be presenting from slides that Susan is projecting. So Susan, I'm gonna kick it back over to you. So you should see a prompt on your screen to show your screen. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thanks, Susan. So, um, 
I'll just mention briefly that uh, my title was somewhat influenced by the literature I read for my four-year-old and my six-year-old, slow slip, fast slip, steep plate, flat, flat plate. Um, but I think it uh, explains a lot of uh, what's going on in, in some of the, the uh, well, specifically in Mexico. Uh, next. And uh, so this is uh, just the Google image of the, um, from Mexico all through Central America. And uh, just this one image I think says a lot. And if you look at where the volcanoes are, first of all, uh, for in Central America there's uh, regular subduction. The volcanoes all sit pretty much right at the coast. You can tell that there's a, I mean, just regular steep subduction. Whereas in Mexico, the Volcanoes are quite a ways inland, and you can, uh, like I said, just from looking at this one image, see a huge difference between the two. The other thing to note is with the distance of the trench uh, from the coast. Uh, in Central America, it's about 130 kilometers uh, on average, except for uh, Costa Rica, the Nicoya Peninsula, which uh, has already been talked about. In Mexico, what we have is about 1,000 kilometers of coastline that are within 100 kilometers of the trench. And this has allowed us to do some interesting things. Uh, next. So here's a, uh, an image that shows uh, some of the different experiments that have uh, happened up until now. So the squares on this are diff different uh, experiments uh, that are mainly temporary experiments, except for the orange squares. The orange squares are the permanent stations that we have. Uh, and then the, the dots that you see are the diff is the seismicity, and they're color-coded by depth. So you can see how they uh, go down as the plate dives. So uh, the plate goes from the trench to about, uh, it dives down to 40 kilometers depth at 150 kilometers from the coast, or from the trench, excuse me. And then it turns and becomes just incredibly fl flat for another 150 kilometers until right to the edge of the volcanic belt. And so the interesting thing here is just how uh, incredibly flat it really is. It just really seems to stay right at 40 kilometers depth for that full 150 kilometers before it dives down again. It's just uh, the flattest, longest uh, slab that we have. Um, it seems to be observed so far in the world. Uh, next. So um, what we have, uh, what's shown here is uh, the, the earthquakes and as uh, has, was shown on a couple other slides, um, one of the interesting things we can see here is uh, also on the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica is that the, since the land is so close, the coast is so close to the trench, uh, the seismogenic zone you know, actually goes beneath the land. And so we've been able to uh, put some experiments right above the seismogenic zone and see how some of this, um, uh, when it makes some observations directly there. So uh, another interesting thing about this that uh, uh, one of the papers I'm working on right now with a uh, colleague, Luca Ferrari, is uh, because we're able to use land-based studies, he, we also can combine that with uh, some geology. And so he did a geochemical study that looked at um, this geochemical pulse as it moves uh, from west to east uh, across the southern part of the, well, basically right along the coast, the southern coast there. And I apologize, the figure uh, is coming out in black. It should have a white background. But you can still see the dots, and those are the measurements of the, uh, the geochemical um, uh, dating of the, uh, well, yeah, dates of the magma along the, the southern coast there. And so what's interesting is uh, it's, it lasted about 10 million years in each point along the coast, except for in the Guerrero Gap. So the gap, um, the, um, in the gap, the, there was a magnetic pulse that lasted for about 40 million years, which was uh, much longer than any other point along there, 45 million years. And uh, what we also see combined with that is uh, there's a slow slip event, so that large red circle right in the middle of the image is uh, the largest slow slip events that have been recorded in the world. They're roughly about magnitude 7.5 and they occur about every four years. And uh, they seem to actually go up and invade into the seismogenic zone. And so uh, one of the things we're looking at is that we think that um, the, we've also been able to do a magnetotelluric um, uh, study here as well. Uh, we're speaking of the magnetotellurics. And we see that um, the fluids seem to be trapped right at the interface there. Uh, and it combined with the evidence from 
the uh, geochemical study, it looks like we're really, um, there's some uh, um, uh, a body that's come up that's been embedded there that's really trapping the fluids at the interface and allowing it to have uh, lower friction or low, uh, and making it so there's slow slip that actually goes up into the typical seismogenic zone. So it's a combination of different techniques that we're able to exploit since we're so close to the trench. Uh, nonetheless, offshore, we really don't know what's going on and that's where we're, we're limited to a large degree. Uh, we don't really know how far off the coast this slow slip event goes, how far is this body off the coast, and so that's where it'd be really interesting to see some of these things. Uh, next. So uh, this other image, uh, again, the uh, black is kind of, uh, they're blocking out some of the, the, the text, but um, the this is an image from Costa Rica, and they're seeing a similar thing to what we're seeing in Mexico. That is uh, that where slow uh, that the slow slip or transient slip seems to be separate from the regular earthquakes. That is, you have either stick slip or slip slow sl uh, or transient slip, but it, the two seem to be separate. So this image comes from a paper by. Um, um, uh, Tim Dixon, and uh, in the middle is uh, an inversion that actually wasn't done by him, it was from another paper um, from Thor and Lay's group, but uh, the blue lines represent the uh, just a regular earthquake that occurred, a recent uh, magnitude 7 plus earthquake, and then all around it, there's slow slip uh, in the red, and so there's the accumulation of the slow slip, and you can see that it's separate from where the regular earthquake has occurred. And so one of the interesting questions about slow slip in general in the world right now, at least I think, is that uh, if you have magnitude sevens, uh, earthquake seven to eight, it seems to be that they're separate from where the, the slow slip is occurring. But there's been a, a couple of recent uh, examples, particularly in Japan and I think Chile now, uh, where there's been slow slip just before the big earthquake and the, the large earthquake invades into the area where the slow slip occurs. But here you can see an example and also in Mexico where it seems like the two are separate. So I think it's kind of an outstanding question as to uh, the role that is to be played between the slow slip and the regular stick slip earthquakes. Uh, next please. Um, this is uh, from a figure uh, from a paper that a colleague of mine, Vala Hjorli Stotter, is going to be uh, submitting relatively soon, or maybe he's already submitted, I'm not sure. But uh, again, these are the different um, earth, or some of the big, large earthquakes that have occurred here in Mexico, and you can see a number of them, again, uh, go onshore. But there's this whole area with the question marks of the offshore area, and um, one of so there's this uh, kind of overall question is what happens there and uh, when do we get the tsunamogenic earthquakes and what's the difference uh, that we get in the coupling in kind of this offshore area. Uh, next please. So this is uh, comes from a figure from uh, Aude and Kim, uh, 2016. Unfortunately, uh, again, it's showing up black again. But um, this is just a, a typical subduction zone kind of image. And there's this general kind of overall model that's coming together where you have the regular seismogenic zone that is stick slip. And then just down the dip of that is a transition zone. And this is some sort of transient slip. This is typically where the slow slip occurs and trimmer, and then further down is a uh, stable sliding zone. But just up dip of that, of the seismogenic zone, there's nothing shown really on this figure. And I think it's kind of an open question as to um, what happens uh, right near the trench. And so one of the interesting things here, right on this same figure, the 2002 earthquake that's just south of the Guerrero Gap, um, right at the trench, appears to be the slowest earthquake recorded, uh, at least according to Joran Engstrom in the catalogs that he's looked at. Um, and uh, Vala is also looking into this, and it seems to have a slip on the order of about a kilometer per second, the rupture speed, I mean. Um, and so it's an it's incredibly slow earthquake, and it's, a, of course, right at the trench. And so uh, I think one of the things that is interesting to investigate is this difference uh, or changes between transient slip to seismogenic zone and um, what happens up at the trench. And so we also, so we have two different types of um, slip or maybe three different types of slip occurring. So we have the regular kind of big earthquake seismogenic zone. We have something really close to the trench and then there's something down dip of that, which is the transient slip where the slow slip occurs. But uh, there's a number of different types of slip that are occurring along along the, the trench here. Uh, next, please. Uh, again. 
this is also from Vala, some other work she's been working on. Um, so one of the interesting things, these are magnitude uh, seven-ish or above earthquakes. Uh, two of them from 1982 and one from 2012. The 2012 one was much larger and she, you see to get the signal right at the same level as the other two, she had to multiply it by 1.7. But um, you can see that the, the, the seismic signals are just incredibly similar from these three different earthquakes. And so Val is looking at these different earthquakes all along the coast here and seeing, do there's this question, do can you large earthquakes repeat? And it seems like at least the seismograms look incredibly similar. And what's interesting is um, some of the earthquakes uh, sitting right on top of each other seem to have very, very similar seismic signals. The waveforms are just uh, identical practically. Uh, there's a close-up you can see of the initial uh, waves also uh, just below the, the, the figure here and they just sit right on top of each other. Um, but there's also some that look just incredibly different sitting right in the same place or at least been located right in the same place. Um, all the, uh, the, in fact, there was one in 1950 that uh, was located right in the same place as these other three earthquakes and has just in a completely different signal. So uh, one of the questions here is, uh, can we have repeating patches for really large earthquakes? This has already been identified for small earthquakes, but I think there's um, a lot of work that could be done that Val is least interested in that uh, we can look at large earthquakes as well for the same question. Um, I think that's all I have. Uh, next, please. I think that's done. And I think I've used up my 10 minutes. Okay, that's all. Okay, well, uh, let me switch it over to uh, Anno. And uh, Anno, you did want to present from your computer, correct? Yep. If correct. It works, I'll do that. Sure, let's do that. <clears throat> so you should have a prompt to share your screen. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So uh, my name is Anna Onken, and I'm, I'm the one from the other continent. I'm sitting back there in, the, in dark Europe right now. Um, I'll be reporting on, on an initiative that has been ongoing for a few years, but that is growing um, as we're sitting here. And uh, you'll likely be hearing new initiatives or components next week during the uh, workshop. Now, part of the motivation of this um, has already been discussed by Sue, but I'd just like to come back to this one important issue, uh, which is nicely shown in the middle part of this uh, plot where Chile really sticks out um, with the global seismic energy release of the last century, indicating that this is where most of um, uh, things are happening. And uh, from the right panel, you've seen that um, it takes about a little more than a century to fill nearly all gaps um, along the uh, South American subduction zone with earthquakes. But there's one big one that's remaining uh, right at the bend, um, the so-called Iquique Gap. And on the left side, you see that this is also one of the places where we have substantial locking and potentially substantial slip deficit that is still that has been accumulated since the last big uh, rupture in 1877. Now the left um, panel also shows that we do know uh, something about the degree of mechanical coupling between the plates. Um, and there is a crude but not very um, clear relationship between the individual rupture events that we know of and this kind of kinematic locking. But as you, uh, we are all aware, this is kinematic observation. It doesn't necessarily directly translate into physics. And this is uh, quite obviously one of the big challenges. So uh, fortunately, we do have a historical record in this area that also shows us, um, at least for some of these parts, uh, the earthquake uh, history since arrival of the, uh, of the Spanish. And in this gap in uh, northern Chile, uh, we've um, seen it closing in the past few years, uh, starting with the Tocopia event in 2007 and um, the major Iquique event that happened um, a little more than two years ago. Um, but as you see uh, also on the right side, uh, there is a remaining deficit that is equivalent to a real nice and big one. And uh, we simply don't know whether it will come in a single one or in a number of individual events. Um, but uh, again, all of this makes this uh, prime target area to really understand uh, what is happening. And uh, the simple plot, um, conceptual plot that I'm showing here is um, again, 
um, alluding to the fact that um, the key questions that is really motivating much of this is not just the earthquakes on the plate interface, but it's the interaction between uh, anything that's happening in the upper plate and uh, the plate interface itself. Um, this um, is becoming clearer as we are looking more closely. We know that a number of these major faults um, are able to produce seven plus magnitude events. Um, none of them has done it historically, but uh, prehistorically there's good evidence to demonstrate that. And there's increasing evidence to also argue that um, some of the volcanic activity seems to be related uh, to either upper plate earthquakes or plate interface earthquakes. Um, we hypothesize, obviously, that there's interactions between these and some kind of feedbacks, but there is very little observational evidence to uh, underscore that. <clears throat> so uh, the obvious challenge is really um, how, how, how does one go forward in observing something like that? And um, this resolution plot um, just um, points out that if you want to capture the full range of displacements, um, uh, over a range of um, time scales, um, uh, you need to make a major effort to capture the entire range of velocities that can emerge. And so basically, this is what it um, uh, uh, turns out to be. You have to have some kind of sensor sensor integration from from high rate instrumental observations all the way down to uh, low rate uh, geological observations to cover the full spectrum. But it's not just that, this is just the kinematics and obviously we're all dreaming of going further to understand um, and capture some of the key physical properties, um, eventual transient um, aspects of these um, and more um, with um, an observatory technology um, that is not really existing at this place. So it's uh, we're not just facing an observational um, challenge, we're also facing a technological challenge of how to go ahead to be able to capture this full range of processes um, that you obviously need if you want to make a step forward in uh, getting towards understanding. So um, since about 2007, um, a growing number of um, international groups has been collaborating and setting up uh, this IPOC observatory. Um, um, embracing the full uh, seismic gap uh, in northern Chile with a range of instrumentation. You see broadband seismographs, strong motion, GPS, magnetotelluric tellurics, uh, creep meters, um, um, mini arrays, uh, and so forth that are observing uh, the volcanoes, um, gas emission uh, instrumentation uh, on the volcanoes, and so forth. But you also note that there's a gap on the offshore area and this was noted by some of the previous speakers. Um, so to give you a glimpse of what this looks like, um, this um, is uh, the current stage, uh, um, state of development. Um, uh, it's not, uh, it, it looks fairly simple and easy, but there's a lot of high tech stuff uh, hidden down there underground. And just to give you an impression of one of the uh, interesting key results that we were able to capture. Um, uh, we had uh, this earthquake in Iquique to a little more than two years ago. And um, uh, although it was a way offshore, we captured enough detail on the way that this earthquake really evolved um, uh, that um, gave us some nice indication of how the rupture process um, started. Um, um, the previous speaker already alluded to the slow slip event uh, that very likely is related to uh, these clusters of earthquakes that started emerging in, in the past um, 12 months before the event and that are superseding a general trend um, that was lasting several years uh, with B value evolving and uh, with cumulative event number evolving in a way that uh, distinguishes uh, both from the background uh, data. Um, also, we note that this is a very neat case showing that indeed there is interaction between upper plate deformation and, and um, plate interface deformation as some of these, in particular the last um, um, foreshock clusters clearly took place in the upper plate and there is interesting feedback or triggering relationships between these kind of processes that would have gone unnoticed without such a high resolution observatory. So where, where are we heading really? Um, as I mentioned before, there's need for offshore observations since this is where most things are happening. Our partners at Geomar are, have uh, deployed OBSs for a while, but um, it uh, has been 
removed, uh, unfortunately, by now because it's uh, been deployed elsewhere. But there's Seaflow Geodesy that is, uh, has very recently been installed. So there is a growing effort, and um, it's obvious that there has, there's a need for more uh, to be done. There's a big challenge, as I note, on the integration of deep time and instrumental time series. Um, this is easier on the kinematic side than on the physical side, but it's one of the big challenges that uh, require efforts uh, from the community. And in particular, when it comes to understanding transient material properties, which is uh, likely playing a major role, as we're beginning to see from uh, various observations. And last not least, um, the iPod community is a growing community. and. Um, uh, we'd uh, be very pleased to have more partners on board and to collaborate in any kind of initiative uh, that is uh, strengthening our efforts in South America. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Anno. Um, all right, so uh, that concludes our formal presentations, and uh, this is an opportunity for folks out there to submit questions uh, if you uh, haven't yet. I have uh, one question queued up and another one uh, that came into my email box. So, uh, you know, before I start reading through those, I think I would just want to emphasize um, there were some questions that uh, were put up during the first three webinars that uh, I think inform in general the kinds of discussions and questions that uh, the workshop wants to have, which are, you know, with respect to everything you just heard, what are the compelling science opportunities for an SEO? What are the capabilities, the data sets, and the infrastructure that would be needed to do that? And what are the sorts of partnerships, uh, both internationally and uh, you know, starting out with this if, if it starts in the US? What would, what would be needed uh, logistically to make uh, stuff like this happen? So let me, uh, as people submit their questions, let me start with what I have. I have a question from Noel Bartlow. And Noel asks, uh, this is uh, for Alan Husker, uh, do you have an estimate of the fluid pressure or effective stress in the Guerrero uh, SSE region? Uh, the quick answer is no. <laughs> uh, we're, we're working on it, um, but no, we don't have a, a, like if you wanted me to put a number to it, there's no real number at this point. Uh, we know that there is high pore fluid pressure, but beyond that there isn't uh, um, an exact number. I, I, um, there's a thesis by a student of Victor Cruz's who's specifically working on this right now. Um, and uh, I guess as that comes to light, we can we, I tell you about it. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, I have a question from Terry Plank, and Terry asks, uh, I agree the imaging of subvolcanic magma bodies is happening now and should be useful for answering the fundamental problem of why magmas stall where they do. Uh, her question is, do MT and seismic tomography converge on imaging magma bodies in the same place, or are they responding to different materials such as magma, mush, brine, or CO2 and or fluids? Well, this is Susan. I can uh, begin to answer that, and I think um, that's exactly why we need a lot more work. In some of the places I'm familiar with in South America, they're not showing um, things at the same depth, and so we're trying to figure out if it's a matter of technique or are, we, are they really sensitive to different things, because ultimately you would like to do a joint inversion with MT and seismic, for example, but if they're sensitive to different things, then that might not be quite appropriate. So there's a lot of work to do there. My, my own sense is that they may be sl uh, sensitive to slightly different things, and so we need to be careful. Um, but there's a lot of other kinds of data to add in, um, more data on attenuation, better data on VPVS ratios, um, and more experimental work to connect seismic velocities to the physical state. All right. Um, I think we have to pause for a second, see if any other questions come in. That's all I have for the moment. All right. I have a, a question from Marino Proti. Um, Marino asks, uh, Mike, as you said, people suggest that eta kites form 
where an internal portion of the slab gets exposed to the hot mantle like the slab front. Is it correct to think that if that is right, they should also form along slab tears? Uh, Marino, I think that uh, in Costa Rica, the edge, the prograding edge of the Cocos Plate as it moves towards Panama and descends at the same time is being hit by a cenosphere. And so it's actually an edge that's melting there. So I think, I hope that answers your question. I could just make a comment on that. This is Susan again. That I, again, I think uh, we're seeing a lot of places along South America subduction zone where we're, we think we're imaging uh, slab tears, and these would be great places to try to look at that in much more detail. If again, if we could get better images and uh, integrate with more of the petrology. So uh, next question is from Jeff McGuire, and Jeff asks, does IPOC have an associated science integration effort, or is it mainly being used as data for projects by small groups of PIs? Yeah, um, it's, um, it, it varies between the individual partners. Um, some partners provide um, instrumentation and data, others uh, have funded um, science going along with it. Uh, so for example, uh, in our group in Germany, we have um, major funding from the German Science Foundation funding a science program um, with a number of PhD students to do research uh, with the data. But as I said, it varies um, at this stage. There's no um, joint international um, science program uh, covering all of it. Uh, great. Uh, next question is from Mario Ruiz, and Mario asks, study of tsunami paleo deposits may enhance our knowledge of past subduction seismic events. Is there any initiative to study these features in South America? Well, I guess we didn't have a, a paleo seismic person um, on this panel, and so I'm not sure I can really answer that, but it certainly should be done. Um, and I know in the past there were studies of the tsunami from the 1960 Chile earthquake that were done all along the coast of, of Chile. Uh, but that may be one of the few ways to really push back the uh, historical record, and it may be a very good way to find some of these uh, tsunami, tsunami genic events that. Uh, We've seen a few of in the last century, but there may be more. Yeah, I, I may add to that. So this is this honor speaking. Um, there's no um, general effort for tsunami genic um, paleoseismological work. There's a number of paleoseismological groups that are working on on uh, earthquake hazard on upper plate faults um, along South America, but most of that is really focused on upper plate faults. Um, there's very little paleoseismological record of um, interface earthquakes uh, other than tsunami genic um, uh, archives, um, and that would definitely be uh, a great value since most of our historical record is just about 500 years old, and that's not even very complete in many places. Uh, this is Yoli from Mexico. There's a couple of groups here in Mexico working on paleoseismology. Actually, Maria Teresa Ramirez is going to be at the Subduction Zone Observatory workshop next week, and she's the one that is working on the on the subduction uh, paleoseismology. I would. Uh, this is Alan. I would also mention that Maria Teresa, the same person, has done some work in Chile, and I have just seen her give a talk, and I can't give any details, but. Um, she's uh, seemed to, there, there, I think there has been work done in Chile, but I just don't know the details. Good. I have a comment from uh, Philip Ruprecht, and he writes, uh, I would like to add two points to the presentations that are worth noticing about the Latin American SEOs that stand out compared to other convergent margins. Uh, point one, 
The Andes are unique in connecting magmatism, tectonics, and ore mineral mineralization processes. And point two, in addition to the many earthquakes, Chile is also the site of the recent relatively large silicic eruptions worldwide. Just in the last 10 years, so understanding silicic magmatism is really best is really best done there. Um, next question is uh, from Edmundo Norbuena, and Edmundo asks uh, that he hasn't heard mentioned yet about subduction channel variations along strike. Would this be a topic that would be considered for an SEO initiative? Well, we could all probably all comment on that, but I would say absolutely yes. To understand all these uh, variations, uh, we'll have to look a lot more at the subduction channel. And South America uh, is particularly good because there's places where there's a lot of sediment being subducted, places where there's tectonic erosion happening, so there are some differences that could be uh, called upon to try to understand what's happening. Uh, just following, uh, we've gotten a few more comments, and one of them uh, was from Teresa Ramirez Herrera at UNAM, and she adds that there has been some effort to look on uh, uh, study tsunami deposits in both uh, Chile and Mexico. Um, so I have a question from Marino Proti, and Marino asked, does anybody know of a place in Latin America where the seismogenic zone of megathrust earthquakes is shallower than 10 kilometers on land? We are submitting a white paper for drilling OSA where the interface is four to eight kilometers deep under the OSA Peninsula. I can't think of any place that it's that shallow below the coastline, but maybe others are more informed than I am. Shirley, do you remember what it was? It's like 10 or 20 kilometers right at the coast of Mexico, right? Yeah, I'm trying to remember the number. It's about 20. So uh, I have a uh, comment from Jonathan Bedford um, that's more of a, a logistics one, uh, and that involves maybe where this would go forward in the future uh, for GPS and geodesy. Um, he's, his concern was just that logistics of running a campaign GPS network can be tricky depending on how uh, the size of the, t how large the uh, team is for that. And uh his example is uh, doing work in Chile with only a couple people um, results in uh, slow progress. So I guess um, something to keep in mind for implementation. So uh, I don't see too many other questions. I'll give it Do a... Do you see the one that's on the chat in the organizers? Uh, I don't. I haven't been looking at that. Let's see. Okay. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, okay. So there's one from Friedrich Tillman. And uh, Friedrich asks, what sort of seafloor geodetic instrumentation should be prioritized? Uh, tilt meters, pr pressure sensors, strain meters, uh, such as the instrumentation at Geomar, or true seafloor GPS transfer to the surface? What are the associated costs? So um, the, I don't have a lot of experience with this. We're starting to work with uh, a Japanese group installing uh, with Yoshi Hiro Ito, uh, installing the OBSs and OBPs off the coast of Mexico. Um, just a small network, but uh, the associated costs are huge <laughs> for anything I've worked on on land. It's a lot more expensive, but uh, I'm definitely not an expert. I don't know if there's somebody, I mean, everybody here who's done the, this in other places, I think is they're the proper people to really answer the question. Well, all I can say from um, uh, the GeoMAR initiative, um, which is basically 
um, built on acoustic transducers and pressure sensors that they are deploying on the seafloor uh, offshore northern Chile. It's an effort that, um, if I if I remember correctly, involves something like a few million, a single digit uh, million number uh, of, of euros um, um, plus ship time, and it only covers a fairly small field, uh, so it's not an option for a full coverage um, of a complete seismic gap. I mean, if you can chip in, I'm seeing my own question in a way. Uh, the, I think there's potential gains in technology, so right now we have to go back to the ship to essentially uh, retrieve the data, but uh, using the wave data technology there might be some savings in the future, it will still be an expensive business. Um, something like seafloor pressure sensors, and I don't really know the technology well enough to, to know the resolution, but they could give uh, a vertical only um, measurement potentially and that might also be cheaper, but I guess the trouble is always getting getting the data back. Yeah, we've actually are purchasing a wave glider here in Mexico that um, uh, we're going to be deploying. So at this point, I can't say anything other than we're going to do try it and see what happens. But uh, it seems to be, like you say, a, a cheaper way to go than actually getting ship time. Yeah, I mean the Geoma people have a wave glider, but it's still in the in the pilot phase. So I have another question from uh, Teresa Ramirez, uh, and Teresa asked, does anybody know on specific efforts to constrain long-term geo long geologic to short-term GPS deformation, spatial and temporal changes on the subduction upper plate, i.e. the fore arc? We are starting this work at UNAM and would be very interested to learn from other experiences. Yeah, again, if I may chime in, um, uh, we'd be equally interested to, to uh, connect with uh, people working on the South or Latin American margin uh, because uh, we share exactly this kind of interest in the IPOC group and maybe that's a good idea to, to get connected with us. I have a comment from Jeff McGuire, uh, who says at the workshop there will be talks on robotics possibilities for both seafloor geodesy and getting the data back from seafloor seismic networks. Uh, I did get one comment earlier from um, Richard Serrano, who is a professor uh, at uh, UTPL in Ecuador, and uh, he just uh, expressed his interest in collaboration on GNSS data in the earthquake zone. Um, I think I would encourage you, Richard, uh, probably to contact uh, any of our panelists if you're, if you're interested in that. I don't see, I'm going to check my email box one last time because a couple have come in there, but I don't see any other questions uh, out there right now. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody in the audience, uh, this has been recorded. Uh, I will uh, hit stop in a moment and this will be posted up on YouTube. So if you missed out uh, on uh, some part of the webinar, you'll be able to catch up and I think it's worth emphasizing that if you have additional feedback, uh, please uh, send that to any of our panelists. They're going to uh, synthesize uh, a little bit of what's been uh, presented and discussed here today, uh, and that will factor into the webinar, or sorry, the, the discussions at the workshop uh, related to not only the, the full SEO plan, but also uh, kind of an outbrief of the webinars. So. I think with that in mind, I will um, I will adjourn our uh, webinar for today. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, panelists, for uh, for your great presentations, and thanks everybody for the questions. And uh, if you have any further questions uh, about the workshop or this webinar, uh, feel free to send us an email.